Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to 20th Annual Toronto Perioperativity Symposium. I want to thank Organizing Committee for inviting me for this symposium. Uh, I'm going to talk about common errors, lessons from three years of Perioperative TQI review at Toronto General Hospital. The objectives of this talk is describe and illustrate common pitfalls identified during QI review of preoperative T studies at Toronto General Hospital. Describe the extent to which studies depart in clinically significant ways from current guidelines. <coughs> and describe the challenges of maintaining an ongoing QI program and potential uh, approaches. In this guideline, I'm using a couple of, in these uh, lectures, I am using a couple of guidelines, uh, and we have to use this guideline always in our daily work. The most important one is this guideline that was published in 2020 by American Society of ECHO and Society of Cardiac Anesthesia, the guideline for the use of T to assist with surgical decision making in the operating room. Because that guideline did not talk about adult congenital heart disease, we should use this guideline as well that was published 2019 about comprehensive TE for children with congenital disease and adult congenital disease uh, because we are doing like about 100 cases of adult congenital heart disease operation per year in Toronto General Hospital. So we have to take care of these patients in the war as well. And of course, the latest guideline of American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association was published in 2021 uh, about management of patients with valvular heart disease. Uh, in the program that I am doing now, this uh, last uh, almost three years, from April 2019 to October 2021, this time, we had about 2,400 intraoperative TE in Toronto General Hospital. Of course, I cannot review all of them, but I reviewed 290 of them. It means only 12 percent. And from this 290, 202 of them were valvular heart disease. So, because that's the area that uh, we need more decision making and we need more detailed echo. 119 of these cases, that's a surprise. It means 59% of all valvular disease that I reviewed, they didn't have any echo uh, pre-op in the Toronto General Hospital. Uh, some of them, they had the echo outside uh, that we can have access by single external, their image. And many of them, we have only report. There is no image available. So when we go to the operating room, uh, the team of interrupt has to start the, to do echo without any previous images. So it's not easy to do a complete echo in 10, 15 minutes and share in decision making. Also, surgeon uh, himself or herself knows the patient very well. Out of 290 cases, 19 patients, it means six percent of them, had a second pom run, and two of them had a third pom run in the war because of a T finding post stop. So T is not only important in pre op decision making, but is more important in post stop decision making about the uh, the completeness of the surgery that we did for patient. This is a breakdown of 290 cases. As you see, the most of them are valve replacement, 
adult congenital disease, valve repair, and different type of surgery. It doesn't mean that, for example, the number of the valve repairs that we do in two, three years is only 55. 55 was reviewed by me. So it was more than this. We are doing like 100 mitral valve repair per year in Toronto General Hospital. Uh, what domain I have looked at in that program for these 290 cases? I use some of my old experience in accreditation in Saudi Arabia. And I use this uh, paper from European Society of Cardiology about the training of uh, team for TE. And especially this paper, very nice paper, from uh, Sunnybrook University in New York. And this is probably the only paper that did a very uh, systematic way, the QI of their program. Also, the program is not a very big program. So they looked at in that paper from New York, four domains, image acquisition, completeness of the study, image interpretation, and completeness of the report. And in my assessment, I broke down this one to two parts, image interpretation pre-op, image interpretation post-op. So it will be the five domains that I have looked at. I give you a case example. 55-year-old man was referred to our center for mitral valve repair. And as you see, the first image, it shows the flail posterior effect. Also, gain is too much. We like to have a good ECG, but many times it's not possible in the world. And this is a severe uh, MR, as you see, anteriorly directed. This is 3D of this uh, pre-op study. You see there is a flail uh, P3. So we have to show this to the surgeon before he or she starts to do surgery and this is the MR that is uh, anteriorly directed coming from that flail part and especially from this commissural part medial commission this is the post-op study immediate post-op you see a flash of color here that flash of color is uh, early systolic and usually when you Track it, go a little bit, mid systole will disappear. After 5-10 minutes, this, this will disappear. So this will not be assumed as a residual MR. <clears throat> you see here, there is no flash of color anymore. And the mean gradient, we always check it because we don't like to have MS after the repair. And always use the dense part of the Doppler, not the less dense part. And there's a couple of papers that we use. We should use the dense part. And this less dense part is because of the pressure recovery effect or Doppler effect. Uh, there's lots of debate about why we have this one. But we see it many times after mitral valve repair or mitral valve replacement. So we use only the dense part. This is a type of the uh, report that I generated for this special case, case number 264. And you see a little bit more detail here. We use the five domain, okay? And this five domain, uh, for each of them, I gave them a score of uh, total 10. <coughs> In this special patient for image acquisition, uh, this study took 10 out of 10, completely so study 10 out of 10. For pre-op uh, interpretation, 8 out of 10, post-op 10 out of 10, and completely so the report 10 out of 10. So five domains, I have looked at it, and I gave to this uh, uh, staff uh, a score of 48 out of 50. It's a very good score. But I will not send this score to them during the report. I will keep it myself. Uh, this is how I describe it. I go to the history of the patient at first a little bit. What was the pre-op finding? It means I will re-report that study. Uh, and I will emphasize to the part that are important. 
a surgical procedure, what was done, because most of the time I've watched the surgery as well. So there was a magic stitch between P3 and the commissioner to, to solve that MR. And in post-op, there was no SAM. So what we should uh, emphasize in the post-op study, for example, I wrote it here, and I gave a, a image number that if they want to go back and look at it again. And how was the final report? This is the magic stitch or Carpentier. And always in my QI report, I have a part that is an educational comment. And this educational comment is related to that special study. And I always use the latest paper published about that part. That's the reason that I have to review the papers very well myself. So, a pre-discharge transtoxic, how was? I look at it always, a pre-discharge echo of that patient. That's the reason that I do the review one week after that surgery to have the post-op T transtoxic as well. And I do my conclusion. Uh, I will send this report, uh, written report, to the staff and the fellows, and I CC it to the director of uh, a PEG program that is uh, uh, Annette and this QI report qualifies for Royal College uh, CME as well so most of our staff are using and I use it myself uh, the question that should be answered do we expect the quality of the echo be exactly like the quality of the echo that cardiologists are doing in the echo lab? For sure, no, because we don't have a, enough time in the OR and uh, the training of our team is different from cardiologists. I'm cardiologist myself. And has there been any improvement of TE quality uh, during this program, these two, three years? Yeah, I see the constant uh, improvement. And, and many times I am inside the OR as well, uh, watching the the T that the staff are doing. So what time uh, our staff uh, do the best? What part? Probably the completeness of the study. The study are very complete. Uh, started from IVC going to the aortic arch at the end. So our very complete study compared to the study that uh, we as a cardiologist, we do it. We do T mainly a goal oriented study. <clears throat> the part that is not very good is image, image acquisition and the reason is clear because our fellow are the first operators, some of them are new, their study quality will be much much better at the end of the fellowship but at the beginning sometimes is not very good but we have to deal with this and the improvement should be mainly in image interpretation and completeness of the report and we should supervise the fellows more when they generate the report. Let me show you a couple of examples that there were error, challenge, and pitfalls. The case number one was a 24-year-old man with a known history of unique aspect aortic valve and had a bioprostic aortic valve replacement. You might ask me why 24-year-old has a bioprostic valve. That was the wish of the patient himself and the uh, immediate post-op T you see this AI so always the question is is this AI valvular or paravalvular we use explain to show it this explain you see the swing ring here you see the AI is coming from inside the swing ring two jets so it's a transvalvular that is a very common finding in the magna valve. You see the CD of this. And as you see in the pre-discharge echo, still I believe that AI is there, or two jets, as we saw it in the OR. But if we follow this patient, this AI will disappear. Eight months later, you see the valve, 
And you see that the eye is not there or very, very trace. This is a very nice paper about uh, uh, transvalvular or pre uh, transprosthetic AI in a magna valve in the OR. And they describe it, why we have it. In this paper that uh, was about 700 patients, they believe the cause of that is this uh, fabric between the ring and the strut. Uh, this fabric, it will leak, most of the time it will close after protamine, uh, but uh, some of them will stay and will be closed in a couple of months. This is the design of this valve, Hancock is a pulsing valve, doesn't have usually commercial leak, but Magna valve and Avalus valve, they have a leak, Magna is more, Avalus has it as well. Case number 268 year, <coughs> year old man, <coughs> Excuse me. I refer to our hospital for AVR. Intraop T was done. This is a pre-op. You see the patient has AS and mild AI. Calcific aortic valve. And uh, this patient had a magna again AVR. Immediate post-op, you see a turbulence at the LVT and you see some AI. More close, that's a transvalvular AI. Here you see, like previous case, the AR is transvalvular, but it's too much. It's not mild. It's like a moderate or moderate to severe. That's a transgastric view. You see the valve has a turbulence and has a lots of AI. And this is the uh, gradient across the valve, very high gradient, and you see this dense part that because of the flow of the AI is a high as well. So this patient has a almost severe AS and moderate to severe AR. Should we accept the result? Of course, no, but this result was accepted, was discussed with the surgeon and the team accepted, and the patient was transferred to the ICU. Uh, was extubated at first and then re-intubated a couple of hours later, was a hypoxic and uh, <clears throat> was not doing fine. On day three, had another TE and this severe AI was shown much, much better than intraop and patient had to come back uh, to the ward on day three. So the cause for that AI, it was not just a simple commissural AI. The cause was when the surgeon did a root enlargement, during the closure of this patch, the surgeon uh, entrapped the leaflet of the biopsic valve as well. So that was the cause of the AI and uh, was redo again another valve. and. Uh, it was okay. The case 355 year old woman had bicuspid AVR due to severe AS. Immediately post stop, beside the valve, always look at the LV and RV function. Here, RV is very good. And after a couple of minutes, RV deteriorated quickly. And this was picked very well by our fellow, Rebecca. And uh, she told the surgeon, RV is not doing fine, he's down severely. So surgeon decided to go back and do the bypass of the right coronary artery, came off, you see the RV improvement. So this was a very good pickup beside the check for valve, always check RV and LV function. Case number four, 70 year, 71 year old man, had the bypass AVR due to bicuspid aortic valve, severe AS, trivial AR. And post-op, we saw this little tissue moving here, and we saw this is a good AI. So we told the surgeon probably 
the leaflet of this new AVR is torn. So, and the AI is too much. So he went back and uh, <clears throat> uh, again here shows that the AI is coming from the area of the left main. But still we thought that AI is because of the turn leaflet. Surgeon went back, couldn't find uh, any turn leaflet, took that small tissue out, came off, and again was the same uh, AI. Uh, he said, it's not okay. He went back again and uh, checked the valve. And this time he found a hole above the valve. There was a hole just below the left main coronary artery that was communicating between aortic root and the LV and acting like AI. So this was a aortrogenic hole. Uh, he closed the hole, but still at the end we had this AI. Here is now more clear. This is transgastric. This AI is outside the ring because there is a communication between here that is the left main, below the left main to the LV. And so the result was not good. This patient developed septicemia later and passed away, I see. 59-year-old woman underwent biopsic MVR in our center. You see in the post-op, this is a MVR. A small flow is here and uh, the team accepted this and thought this is just a small part of our leak. Uh, Year later, the patient came back with fatigue, and when they did the transtastic echo, they saw the lateral wall and anterior wall is hypo. And they did T in the echo lab. They found this leak is much, much more than before, and it's a continuous. It's not part of our MR that is systolic. It's a continuous flow. It's a very, very nice sweep. Uh, of that flow, you see the flow is from circumflex and going to the uh, LA. So this was a damage of the circumflex uh, that was not picked up in the war. So this is a year after. Uh, you see again a nice sweep shows the flow, continuous flow from circumflex to the LA. Uh, a damage to the circumflex during mitral valve repair or replacement happens is not common, it's about less than one person, and this is the only case that we had during the last three years. This couple of paper about the damaging of the circumflex during the mitral valve repair or replacement. In summary, comprehensive approach to the QI in perioperative T can improve the quality of the studies performed by the uh, preoperative T team. It is very important to perform a complete exam in a systemic manner for all patients whenever is possible. Intraoperative echocardiography should be an integral and active part of the heart team for decision making. Clear communication and having a common language with the surgical team are crucial to overcome the challenges and possible complications that may occur in the course of the surgery. Ideally, more studies should be reviewed by the QI program. However, the main challenge is the time limit, as each case review takes between two to three hours in order to be significant, scientifically grounded, comprehensive, and educational. Uh, for the related staff and fellows and uh, of course we need always the feedback from the uh, staff cardiac anesthetist in the OR that I send the case uh, uh, for them. Thank you very much.